So today we're going to talk about the gravitational redshift, which is a shift in a black body's electromagnetic radiation spectrum due to gravitational field. And its effects are very similar to the Doppler effect that we learned about in lecture series 5.1b, where if you've got an object moving, uh, the wavelengths in front of it will bunch up, while the light wavelengths behind it will spread out, causing a change in the relative uh, wavelength. However, uh, the gravitational redshifting works a little bit different, and the first way to think about it is, classically, as an object moves away from a large body, it gains gravitational potential energy and loses kinetic energy due to conservation of energy. And this makes sense, you know, as your particle um, gains a height, your potential energy of mgh increases. And to satisfy conservation of energy, your kinetic energy, therefore, would have to decrease, and since the photons frequency relies on kinetic energy. If the energy goes down, the frequency will go down, increasing the wavelength. Another way to look at it is through special relativity, which states that time moves slower in larger gravitational fields and faster in smaller gravitational fields. So if your photon moves from an area of high potential to low gravitational potential, it's effectively, uh, time is effectively passing faster for it relative to itself. This means the time period is effectively going to increase, and since frequency is inversely proportional to time period, frequency will decrease, and since frequency decreases, since wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, the wavelength will increase, thus causing the redshift. So how is gravitational redshift used? Well, astronomers use it to study white dwarf stars, specifically, um, because they have a small radius and lots of mass. And they're basically used to identify and understand their structure because astronomers can use the redshift in light to determine the mass and radius of the star. Now it's important to note that the redshift is very small. It's usually only tens of picometer, picometers or about one Armstrong. However, one big case that gravitational redshifting was used was on measuring the mass of star Cirrus B uh, where the Hubble telescope measured the red redshift and determined that Cirrus B has about 98% the mass of our Sun, but a radius smaller than Earth. Thus, Cirrus B has actually a gravitational field 350,000 times that of Earth. Now the math. Finding the change in frequency of a photon from a star. So the best place to begin with is, because we don't want to deal with special relativity, is the classical conservation of energy equation where we've got the energy at the beginning is equal to the energy at the end, and the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Now there are two relationships we're going to need to know, and that is the energy of a photon, which is equal to the kinetic energy of the photon, is given by Planck's constant times its frequency. The other thing we'll need to know is that the effective inertial mass of the photon is given by the Planck's constant times its frequency all over c squared. And you might recognize the combination of these two as E equals mc squared, where your energy here is um, Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon. So using this, plugging in our frequency and Planck's constant as a kinetic energy into those places, we have the Planck's constant times the frequency at infinity plus the potential at, at infinity equals the kinetic energy the photon has at the radius of the star plus the potential energy it has at the radius of the star. Next I want to bring in our gravitational potential energy equation which you all remember from basic physics course where you've got the gravitational constant times the two masses of the objects you're working between along with the radius between them. So when we plug that in for our potential energies, and we plug in our effective mass into the mass here as our inertial mass, we're left with this equation here, um, where if we divide out by Planck's constant, we'll get this equation here, as well as factoring out our frequencies at the radius of the planet. And this equation basically is saying the frequency of our photon at a radius of infinity is equal to the frequency of the photon at the radius of the star times some constant. 
And an important thing to note here is if uh, g m sub s over r c squared is between 0 and 1, it's basically saying that v sub or our frequency at the radius of the planet will be multiplied by some fraction, 1 over c, or basically less than 1, which means our frequency will decrease at infinity, and thus our wavelength will increase. However, a fun thing to note here is if g m sub s over r c squared becomes greater than 1, then this term here will actually become negative. Now our frequency will actually not go negative, but what it's stating is, is that the potential energy at infinity is greater than the energy the photon had to begin with. Which means this star is actually a black hole, because the photon does not have enough energy to escape to a certain radius. So if this uh, cons if this term holds true, you're actually dealing with a black hole, and if this term holds true, you're dealing with a star, where if this term is closer to zero, you're going to have a higher redshift, and if it's far, uh, closer to one, you'll be having a lower redshift. And if um, you use the equation C equals the frequency of the photon times its wavelength, you can actually solve for the shift in wavelength by solving this equation for frequency, and thus for any star you can calculate the redshift of its light.